Welcome to the selling show where we unpack, repack, and break down exactly how top experts sell their ideas, their value, and their services. This is your host, David Newman, and you are in the right place if you want better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees. Well, my friends, you know, this show is all about sales and selling, but I'll tell you, selling is hard. Selling is hard and selling is getting harder unless you actually know what you're doing. And my next guest, Mr. Gabe Lulo, CEO and founder of Alley Oop, has mastered this to a degree that I think you will find both surprising, refreshing, and incredibly enlightening. Gabe, welcome to the show. Thank you, David. By the way, huge fan of yours. So really excited to be on this uh, podcast and talking to your audience today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's start with, I'm always curious about your professional journey that brought you to the work that you're doing today. And then what were some interesting pit stops along the way? Well, I... You know, went to school for business. Uh, I'm, I'm a, you know, a salesman by heart, though. I think I, my my uh, way of figuring that out was I was 11 years old, and we were doing a fundraiser selling T-shirts for our school, and I sold uh, like 11 of the exact same very poor quality T-shirt to my uncle, and I convinced him to buy it. I said, okay, I can. They'll pay me money just to talk. This is amazing. So, always had that you know gift of gab, if you will, and got into sales at a young age. Was an SDR actually interning uh, during college, booking appointments, and um, but I got into the executive recruiting side of the business, uh, focusing on recruitment, 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 building uh, you know sales teams, uh, executive teams, go to market teams for ten years, and then uh, we you know we looked at the role of SDR, which was really coming out. Uh, back then and saw that this could be something we can get excited and, and get behind. So we built out an, an SDR um, agency, which has morphed into a, a huge business for us. And we're really proud of it and excited about it. We've been doing it uh, going on 15 years, serving a lot of cool companies and clients. And uh, we have hired and managed over 2,000 SDRs in our career. So we're pretty excited about that. Walk us through Gabe, the intern, uh, mm-hmm. or not not intern, but young SDR, yeah, uh, budding SDR, to now running this enormous firm that has client names that you will recognize, some that you might not recognize, some unicorns that have taken off to a hundred x. To give us kind of the baby step. So at first, was it you? Was it you and a small team? How did the whole thing evolve? I've always been passionate about the top end of the sales cycle, right? It's booking the appointment, having those quick conversations and being, you know, the the, the front of the lines, the, the door opener, if you will. And, you know, first impressions are everything. I was taught that at a young age. So I said, you know what? This is something I got really excited behind. Now, don't get me wrong, closing deals, negotiating, getting contracts is always very fun. But I think it really was overlooked and has still to this day an overlooking of of the sales development role. People look at the SDR role as just kind of like an entry level, you know, way or gateway to become an account executive. And we don't look at it like that. You know, we have SDRs here that have six grandkids. You know, we have SDRs here that have been doing this and working for us for for many, many, many years. Now, there are a lot of comp- people that move on and want to grow their career and use this as a stepping stone for sure. But at the end of the day, there are people that truly do like prospecting versus the pressure of closing deals. And so, you know, as as, as a bunch of us, actually, we have uh, two brothers that were founding the company. Uh, I was a part of the co- the founding team, and we really grew it into a, a company that we wanted to just know what we were good at. You know, we've dabbled and looked at other things. Hey, should we move into software? Should we move into full cycle sales? Should we move into training? And we're like, you know what? We've been really good at this thing. Let's not confuse what we're good at and let's just double down on that. And that's what we've been doing. And it's it's been winning for us in a big way. We talked a little bit before we turned on the microphones that yeah. LinkedIn in, in particular is becoming so problematic. And I yeah. know that you use multi-touch, multi-mode, multi-method, email, 
uh, calls, you know, a whole campaign is built around this, which we'll also talk about. But LinkedIn in particular, people have become so sales averse or even connection averse that they're afraid that every incoming message is going to be connect and spam, connect and spam, connect and spam. Hey, Gabe, can I help you with your phone systems? Hey, Gabe, if you need some financial you know, line of credit, hey, Gabe, can I sell you a photocopier? That's like, who are these people? Where are they coming from? And I think when people think SDR, BDR, prospecting, cold calling, that's the picture they have in mind, is the clueless, batch and blast, random, everybody's a lead, so I'm going to wallpaper the universe with outreach. Tell us what's wrong with that and, and why that perception, when your clients come to you, perhaps a little bit bruised and, uh, and beat up around hiring other firms that do it wrong. How do we get rid of that negative image of initial strategic outreach? Yeah, for sure. And, and you nailed it right on the head. That's how our, our feeling about it. I mean, if you look at it, I think what's happening is people are treating LinkedIn like they're treating email, which is the spam cannon automation spray and pray mentality. And, you know, we call it pitch slapping. Yes. <laughs> you know, make sure I, I pronounce that correctly. I don't want to swear on the call here, but pitch slapping. And what's interesting is you have to think about it from a different perspective. Social media and, and LinkedIn is a, you have to look at it as a content mechanism. It's about distribution content. And if you, you and again, most of the people who are hitting you with these slaps and pitches all day long, post nothing, literally nothing. They don't even reshare other people's posts. They just sit there and post, 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 post. There's 817,000 LinkedIn profiles for SDRs right now. And, and many of them are not posting any content, but they're using this tool to, again, hit people with, with these very long uh, call to actions with calendar links attached to it. And it's just no one is interested. Yeah. The way we do in LinkedIn is we're very content focused. Personally, my page, I post every day. Uh, all of my customer facing go to market leaders post at least three times a week. And all of our SDRs are also, we call them mini influencers who are, who are sharing relevant content for our clients because a lot of them are white labeled to our client. And then using that content as leverage to engage, create, and, and offer conversations. And if people look at you as a thought leader, if people look at you as you're driving content, um, and then at that point, they feel like they know you, like you, and trust you. And then at that point, you're willing to uh, open up a dialogue. So if you connect with me, you'll always get a message, um, but it'd be very short and sweet and it, it, it has zero call to action to it. Uh, and it asks, you know, hey, hope you like my posts. I post every day. If you have any questions, let me know. And then uh, after a while, once they've seen me a while, then at that point, um, we can navigate a conversation and it's always, you know, very organic. We interrupt this interview with an important announcement. If you're committed to better clients, bigger deals, and higher fees, get over to doitselling.com right now and grab a copy of my new book. That's the deal, kids. Grab a copy of the new book and then get all the bonuses, companion tools, trainings, and downloads at doitselling.com. Buy the book, get the bonuses. Buy the book, get the bonuses. Buy the book, get the bonuses. That's how it works. I'll see you over there. This whole concept of outsourcing sales, some CEOs of mid-sized companies, and obviously you've also worked with Fortune 500 companies, Adobe, yeah. Cisco, yeah. MasterCard, the whole deal. Uh, but the mid-sized companies that would probably be listening in here, they're like, well, you know, I'm a little bit scared because isn't sales kind of a central core function of our company? And mind you, these are the same CEOs who said, oh man, sales mishires, you know, hiring, hiring uh, an eagle, and it turns out they're a duck. Yeah. People that are great at closing, but can't open a freaking door. Uh, right. There have been so much disappointment in this area of initial, I don't even call it cold calling. I know that cold calling is kind of the label that we sometimes use. Sure. It's initial conversations, or as you said, door opening, Pros right? Prospecting, In yeah. How do you initiate a relationship? Well, there always has to be a first contact. 
Yep. And, you know, a lot of these folks say, well, you know, inbound marketing, which is a whole layer of BS that you and I can unpack here in a minute. It's yep. all inbound marketing. Gabe, I'll tell you, we are so, so heavy into word of mouth. We love referrals. We live on referrals. Like, well, if all you're eating is blueberries, then yes, you're living on blueberries, but there's such a thing as chicken, beef, and pork, and you should try it. And right. that is outbound. Tell us a little bit about the 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 mid-market CEO or mid-market VP of sales. What is their allergic reaction to outbound when you and I both know outbound done right works so well? You know, it, sales development and outbound really is a marketing function. And a lot of people, you know, don't love when I say that. But at the end of the day, it's a marketing function because we're not actually closing revenue. I mean, you're spending money on billboards, you're spending money on ads, you're spending money on Google, you're spending money on search engine optimization, you're spending money on radio. I mean, it depends on your your audience, of course. But sales development is no different than putting money into a marketing function to gain awareness, to gauge interest, to create intrigue, and of course, to create and drive you know meetings. Now, when you look at what we do differently, uh, is we don't just drive meetings. One to three percent of the market is actually open to buy. So if you're just using meetings as your north star, you're going to get high pressured SDRs. You're going to get people being bugged and pitch slapped and called twenty times a day, and it really burns your brand. So we look at it as the whole pipeline creation, you know, and we bucket every single prospect we talk to, and we share that contact uh, information with our clients along the way. So I think the big part about outsourcing is that it's only focused on the meeting, and that's the only deliverable. And it really creates again a lot of uh, bad taste, and uh, and then of course you know if you don't get a lot of meetings, you're feeling like you're not getting a lot of good job. Well, the way we do it differently is we showcase to our client through our reports everything that's happening along the entire sales journey up until the demo. No differently how you would track pipeline for revenue in the AE world. We treat the same sales journey, but to the demo is our contract, if you will, right? So where do they fall? Are they open to evaluate in 60 days? Are they open to evaluate in six months? Are they never going to talk to you ever because they hate you? I don't know. But we're going to share that insights with our client. And usually that changes the VPs of sales lens on, on what we do and how we do it. But to your point, I mean, a lot of companies outsource their financials to a, a, uh, accounting uh, agencies. And I yeah. think that's just as important, if not more important than sales. You know, So it, if you think about it, it's definitely a great way to go to market and also test it out. I mean, if you're going to think about building an outbound, you do it yourself. It's very expensive, a lot of trial and error. And most of the time, it's going to cost you twice or three times more than if you use an agency and then parlay it into an in-house team. Let me ask you about when when someone comes to Alleyoop, talks to one of your team, sure. and says, you know, we don't need thousands and thousands of calls. We have a very, very tight market niche. So they might have, they might have a total addressable market of like 6,000 companies, period, in the world yep. that they ever yep. want to talk to. And you're saying, well, we can do thousands of touches a month. It's like, well, that's not what we need. As, as for some people, it's exactly what they need and they love it and they they profit from it hugely. Talk about the hyper niche type of client and how, how does the campaign change? How, well, how do the strategies vary when it is a super tight niche that these folks are trying to get meetings from? For sure. That's so great that you brought that up. So we work backwards, and by working backwards is the database, the TAM, if you will, the total addressable market, is really how we work backwards in designing the campaign. So before we even sign contracts with clients, we don't take on any client until we go through a strategy session. And the strategy session is designed to determine what their ICP is, and we use all of our different data partners, we have many, to then put together what we see is the total addressable market. And then we figure out based on budget and based on that strategy session, what the campaign size is and the metric attached to that campaign size. 
So if it's a niche market, we're not going to have 20 SDRs making 300 calls a day to do that. Uh, we'll probably be done with the whole market in a week. Uh, but if it's a smaller market and it's more hyper specific, we'd have less dials per day and less activity um, KPIs per day per rep and a smaller team. And we can go down to a half a resource. Now they're still dedicated. They're just spending 20 hours on one campaign, 20 hours on the other campaign. That's as low as we'll ever go because adding too many layers to an SDR's desk is overwhelming and, and not very good quality. But we can have, you know, we have a founder right now where he's actually the AE, the CRO, the CMO, the CTO, and the CEO. And uh, we're putting meetings on his calendar and we have a half a resource doing so and it's working flawlessly for him. He can also scale up or scale down based on industry uh, you know, needs and, and, and do that as well. So that's how we attack every single client based on the data. The, data, the list is the strategy. A friend of mine, Ryan, he says it all the time. And I think it's a great quote. The, the list is really how we decide you know, how we're going to build this thing. Yes, 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 yes. One of the many feathers in your cap, again, just for the folks who are listening, uh, when you say we have many data sources, we have many ways to pull in leads, etc. One of the ways that I think almost everyone has heard of is Zoom Info. So you might you may ask yourself, dear listener, uh, when Zoom Info wants to build their client base, who do they call? Well, the answer, my friends, is Gabe Lulo and Ali Oop, because you've done campaigns for Zoom Info itself, getting in front of more VPs of sales and, and sales managers who might not have a fantastic resource like Zoom Info in their toolkit yet. Yeah, funny story. So when Henry and the founder, who's the founder and CEO of Zoom Info, um, was building his company, which was then called Discover Org back in the day, uh, we were the SDR agency that built out their entire SDR function and drove all those appointments for eight years. Uh, currently today, their senior vice president of uh, sales development, who runs the team of hundreds of SDRs and their team, was the first SDR making calls uh, on that campaign here. And he was an employee here at Alley Oop, and he's a good friend of mine. But long story short, uh, when you know Zoom Info was building their business day one, we were the founding SDR team for them and, and stayed with them for many, many, many years and had, and still have a great relationship with them. They're a referral partner. They send us leads. And uh, we also obviously love their data. Um, but yeah, that, not only Zoom Info, though, moreover, we, uh, we've worked with a lot of other data providers. We're, we're loving Sales Intel right now, uh, Apollo. They're great providers and, and partners of ours as well. So this is kind of like, well, when Google needs help with search, who do they call? It's like, well, whoever that is, <laughs> probably yeah. knows what they're talking about. So tell us a little bit about getting through to high level people, because I think the other, the other myth is that you can't cold call CEOs. CEOs are behind bulletproof glass. They've got screeners, they've got admins, they've got assistants. And again, you might not be able to get through to Tim Cook at Apple. Right. That's probably right. a fact. But most of us are not after Fortune 50 CEOs. We're after Inc. 5000 CEOs. So talk about the appointment getting process when we do want to talk to the head of a five, 10, 20, $30 million company. You know, they're more accessible than you think. I mean, CEOs are, are, are people no different um, and, and they are accessible uh, as long as you talk to them the right way. I don't think it's a matter of getting them. It's a matter of what, what do you say when you do get them and how do you impress them enough to want to sit down with you is I think the most important part to take a look at. I mean, their contact information is usually correct in our databases. And so you do, and you can get their information, but it's about what you say to them and how do you impress them enough. Doing it cookie cutter frame, you know, just a simple, a simple uh, you know, template is not the way to do it. You got to treat them like you're different than everyone else. Uh, and that's what they gravitate to. I still pick up cold calls. My phone rings. I answer the phone and People pitch me and I, I uh, you know, I absolutely have conversations and, and get meetings and people book meetings with myself. But at the end of the day, you have to know what you're going to say to a CEO and they are and they are reachable. Um, but it's not about reaching them more importantly. It's about what you say to them when you when you do connect. 
Yes. Well, let's talk about that. So, so okay. from your from the client's perspective, an alley oop yeah. client, they may come to you with a fantastic product or service, but it's not obviously apparent on the surface. How is this better, cooler, faster? How is this? How do we articulate the differentiation so that they can win the meeting? And I'm sure some clients haven't even thought about the differentiation. We have to do a little bit of digging to really find what is different, cooler, better, faster, smarter, whether that's a competitive analysis or just some new sales messaging. Do you work with clients on that? Hey, why should a CEO even bother to talk to you? Because right now this looks very vanilla. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we actually build specific talk track scripts and objection handling guides not just for the client uh, and, the, and, and their brand, but also for the specific persona of who we're reaching out to. So all of our SDRs who are assigned to a client, they are saying different things to different personas within the org to get that message across. And, it, and it's important. You know, If you talk to a CFO, they care more about financial ROI and numbers than if you were talking to a CMO, that would actually probably not interest them. And yeah. you're, what you're saying is now disinteresting those parties. So you absolutely need to articulate. And to the CEO, it's all about you know, typical financials and, and of course, culture and, of course, growth uh, and assisting them in, in funding or, or their board, depending on the size of their business. So articulating those types of conversations is what we train our reps to do when, when assigned to a campaign. And you also have, you have a very interesting service offering, which I want to ask you about, but it looks like it's a it's it's not uh, it's not cookie cutter. It's not templatized, but it is it is very well productized. So there are definitely ingredients and building blocks that you customize and tailor for each one of the clients that hires you to run a campaign. So tell us a little bit about what's in the ultimate assist package of services and you know done for you implementation. And then tell us also about the plug and play service and how that works. Yeah. So long story, this is a funny story. So about 10 years ago, we had this client and we were growing. We started off at one SDR, then we moved to two. And then, then we were doing it for, this is our second year. We're at six SDRs. They're hyper growth. Everything's going great. And you know, if you if I if I was a betting man, which I'm not, and you said, hey, Gabe, I bet you they don't renew. I would say, I'll give you all the money in the world they're going to renew. And this is literally what happened. We walked into the office. All six of those reps didn't show up to work. And that client, not only did they not renew, they hired all of our reps behind our back. And so obviously, we, we got to sue. We got to go crazy. This is horrible. This breach of contract. And then I looked at it and I said, okay, we can do that. Or we can learn from this and figure out ways where we can grow our programs and our business model to a company's clients. Because essentially, that's a good thing. We're doing a great thing. This is like, why, why ruin a good thing? Like We are, want our clients to be successful. So the way we built our programs is we looked at it just like sizing of a t-shirt. You know, if you're a small, if you're a small t-shirt, you're a small, this is what you should do. You should do ultimate assist because it's fully managed, fully enabled, fully supported. We are running everything from VP on sales development all the way down, data technology, dialers, emails, everything. But then it's going to evolve and you're going to grow and you're going to have a bigger stage of your business. And you may want to bring that in-house and you may want to take in a VP of sales and you may want to have a CRM that is showing your entire uh, prospecting journey. You may want to you know, do things in-house. And we totally appreciate that. So plug and play is really a design for that medium shirt type person where now they could plug our trained, vetted, experienced reps into your ecosystem and your tech stack, but it's an SDR on demand at that point. So now instead of you having to hire and retain and train and manage and have a culture of reps, you know, we have 150 SDRs on our sales floor. You know, Having a, a culture and an environment like that, our reps love it, and you get to have that culture and, and, and still plug them into your ecosystem. So that's where plug and place comes in. And then we also have all of our reps are hireable. It's very unique to us. Our SDRs can leave us. We celebrate it. We call them alley alumni. And it's kind of like Brian, right? The senior vice president of Zoom Info. He left. He was here very successful, worked on that program very well for many years. 
but now he runs it in-house at that client. So we offer an opportunity for not only our SDRs to grow their career and become superstars, but our clients to also build their teams internally and come back for more. So we, we never lost a client like that ever again. And uh, that story was definitely a turning point to offer all these programs across the board. So I'm, I'm just, I'm channeling all the CEOs who are listening and their shivers going up and down their spine, Gabe. It's like you walk in, we worked so hard, we hired, we tested, we vetted, we trained. We went from two to three to four to six. One day, the six were poached. They're gone. Yep. And you had to start over literally hiring at zero. Yep. Did you rebuild it to six right away or did you build it up to eight or 10 just as insurance? <laughs> No, we definitely bounced back from that and rebuilt it. Not a problem at all. And, uh, you know, it, it, it definitely taught us a lot of things. And now, uh, you know, when an SDR decides that they want to move on and a client agrees and they, they also want us to hire them, uh, they're very happy. Actually, we have some scenarios where our clients do want to hire our reps and our client and our reps don't want to leave. You know, you know, they really like the culture here. They are, you know, it's a scary time right now. There's a lot of companies out there that, one decision, one financial move, you got to do a reduction in force. And, you know, working here, if you're a good SDR, you, you pretty much have a job for life because there's always something that needs to be sold. And our clients uh, have, a, have an opportunity to always come back. So our reps really like staying. Yeah, no, I love that. That, that in, in itself is a huge testament to your success. Let me ask you again, just inside, you know, inside sure. the curtain, so to speak, scaling and growing. How did you learn systems, process, training, delegation? Because obviously the company is way bigger than, you know, Gabe sitting in his basement with a couple of phones and a couple of computers and six beer drinking buddies. Uh, <laughs> not, not that they were ever beer drinking buddies, but, but to, to develop the firm to the extent that you have, you had to learn systems, process, delegation, building a team, empowering others. What was that journey like for you personally? Well, a big part of it is, is my recruitment experience because learning how to find really good people in my recruitment days before coming here was, I think, my biggest learning experience that I could bring to the table. I was able to find and surround myself around really, really smart people. Speaking of Apple, I think it was Jobs that said, you know what I mean? The best way to, to, to build a business is find people that are, employ people that are smarter than you. And so I, I, I was humble enough. A lot of CEOs aren't humble. So I was humble enough to, to find people who literally were smarter than me. And I said, listen, I'm here to pay you to do a job that I can't do, but I want you to teach me how to do it along the way. And so that's really how I did it. I hired someone smarter than me who I and, and things I couldn't do or didn't want to do. And I asked them to teach me how to do it. And I did that, you know, in the beginning stages. And then now it's taught me, you know, how to find the right data partner, how to find the right dialer, how to find the right email, how to find the right content people, how to find the right recruitment people, how to find the right, you know, stra strategy in place for reporting and onboarding. So Every one of those pieces, it was a learning experience for sure. But I think my recruitment, I, a lot of people say that one of the biggest attributes you can have as a, as a CEO is, is to be a great recruiter. Yeah. And I think that's a big part of how I was able to learn those things. Yeah, super, super important. I mean, that's almost the, uh, the CEO superpower is if you know how to find great people in any economy, right? Be like, oh, there's a talent shortage and oh, there's a hard to find people. You know, this is the CEO's cliche refrain. It's hard, Gabe, it's hard to find good people. It's like, well, it is if you don't know what you're doing. And right. it's really, really uh, important that you know how to find good people, regardless of the economy being up or down or sideways. Talk a little bit about the culture that you've built, because you mentioned about, hey, some people don't want to leave. What are some of the intentional culture building moves that you've made talk a little bit about the alley -oop values how does all that work yeah so i mean some of some people don't know what alley -oop means in basketball it's the ultimate assist and so it, it, it's that point in time where an nba player a basketball player would throw a ball perfectly so someone else could come in and slam dunk it 
And it, that's really our role, right? Our job is to not be the, the person in lights. Our job is to not be the deal. It's our job is not to get the credit. That's our client's job. Our job is to set them up perfectly for them to be able to do that almost uh, you know, effortlessly, right? So we really like that thematic gamification of basketball and we bring it in-house into our culture. So all of our different teams are the alley-oop Knicks, the alley-oop Bulls, the alley-oop Lakers. We have team captains. We have managers. We have uh, coaches. Uh, these are internal titles that we have that are very uh, gamified. We have monthly competitions for everything. We have the best teams, the best reps, the best campaigns. We have LinkedIn competitions, email competitions, phone competitions. So gamifying everything that we have a scoreboard, right? So we have the scoreboard throughout the day about it's a ticker of almost like the stock market. Every time new meetings are set or new leads are booked, uh, it, it's going on and everyone's high-fiving in a virtual environment. We have a uh, virtual sales floor, which is video focused and everyone's making calls in a sales floor that allows you to high five and, and do gong uh, symbols uh, when people are closing appointments. So it's very fun and gamified is I think the most important part. Here's the second layer, which I think we do uniquely, but it's, it's a huge win for us. We have a lot of people on our sales floor. Most, uh, mostly people don't have that size of a team. But even a size like ours, we can do this. And a lot of people say, oh, I can't do that. It's, it, you know, our team's too big. I'm like, our team's about 10 times the size of yours, and we still do this. We personalize commissions and spiffs and bonuses to the rep. Now, not everyone is going to do jumping jacks for money. Not everyone is going to want a monetary value. Now, of course, people want to get paid. But PTO, is, pay time off, is a great incentive. Big screen TVs is a great incentive. Amazon gift cards, uh, you know, someone who just had a baby, you'll buy them, you know, buy by baby gift cards. Like, so we personalize it and it's simple. We do a Google form. We ask them, hey, how do you want to be incentivized? And we find out what interests them, what excites them. And we build comp plans around them that's more personalized for them and people run through walls for it. And so that's part of the way we have a culture and environment. Your folks are physically in one location, or is there also some virtual happening, or is it mostly virtual? It's all virtual. We we actually were in offices, and we left a year before COVID in 2018. Uh, so it wasn't because of COVID. It was it was because we wanted to do it. And so everyone's fully remote, um, and, and we love it. And we use tools, technologies, video a lot uh, to to create that culture that we were talking about. Wait, 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 wait. We're not just going to listen to this episode. There are downloads, there are resources, there are links, there are bonuses waiting for you on this episode's page when you go over to doitmarketing.com forward slash podcast. That's right, doitmarketing.com forward slash podcast. Grab the notes right under this episode. See you over there. You, you do a beautiful job setting up the initial meetings. Uh, you hand it off to the salesperson in-house that's going to do the initial discovery or the demo or whatever. They screw up those calls. Your phone rings. Gabe, these leads sucked. They weren't interested. They didn't buy. We usually convert 30%. We're converting these guys at 10%. What the heck is wrong with the leads? You have a chance to listen to the calls if they, hopefully they record them. You're like, this guy screwed up everything. Of right. course he messed Of course he lost the sale. Of course he didn't go to step two. Knowing that you're doing your job to a superb level, some of the clients don't have the skilled frontline sellers to take the deal over the finish line. How do you handle that diplomatically? And what are some resources that you make available to them to help solve that problem? So this is a really good message that I've been talking a lot about over the last 12 months, more than I ever have in my career. And I would say the biggest reason why is because, and we show them side-by-side -side comparisons because we have a lot of clients that are competitors of, our, of, of each other. So we show them, okay, listen, we drove 20 meetings to this client and to the same exact ICP, same exact, they're complete competitors. We also drove 20 meetings to that company and that company closed two and this company closed 10. And the difference was that company. 
And we also do a lot of that for uh, show up rates, right? We have two competitors right now where we're booking, let's say, 10 meetings. Seven of them show up. We have the same exact type of client, and only one of them is showing up out of 10. The difference is, what does your content look like? What does your website look like? What does your follow-up process look like? Are your AEs introducing themselves, saying, I can't wait to meet you? I did some discovery, and I'm looking forward to our call tomorrow. Or are they just sitting there waiting when the when the call happens and not even following up if they don't show up after five minutes on the Zoom call? So how you treat these leads is a lot to do with the success, not just not just it's a band-aid at that point if you can't get your house in order. So we warn our clients to say, hey, get your house in order if it's not in order, because we're gonna drive leads your way. And if you can't convert them, um, unfortunately, that's not on us, but we also understand it. To answer your second part. We have a network of CROs, fractional CMOs, fractional CROs, sales trainers, who we point them to and say, hey, listen, you got to call these guys, call this person. They can come in and help you down the funnel and and help uh, get this back on track. I was going to ask you that exact question about, do you have a network of sales trainers, sales resources that you can sometimes connect them with to help solve the problem? Yeah, we have a partnerships community. So all of those fractional CROs and CMOs that we work with, we have a partnerships opportunity where we offer a rev share. So in 60% of our new business comes from our network of, of referral partners. But on the flip side, it's it's mutual. We we send them a ton of business too, uh, because again, we don't touch the down the funnel stuff. Yeah. And we point them in, in, into the people or companies or agencies that specialize in usually their product or niche and and get out of the way. I want to talk the last thing before we kind of land the plane here and then share some ways that people can get connected and stay connected to more Gabe Lulo brilliance. There's a critical point that you just mentioned, and I'm so glad you brought this up, about cancels and Mm no-shows. The critical time is between the call is booked and the call happens, which hopefully is short, but it could be two days, three days, four business days. What have you found with your clients that are really knocking the cover off the ball? What do they do during that two, three, four days? One thing you mentioned already, which is the account executive reaches out. Hey, Bob, I see we have a call Thursday at two. I did a little bit of research on your website. I got a couple ideas. I'm super excited to talk to you. Do we do we send a quick PDF? Do we send them some value? Do we? How do we keep them warm and excited and anticipating that call? Like they have the chance to talk to a real expert, not a salesperson. It's like, oh, I'm looking forward to our sales call, said right. no prospect ever, right. but they're looking forward to an educational call. They're looking forward to talking to someone who knows what they're doing and has true expertise to share with them. How do we tee that up in that critical period between call is booked and call is scheduled to happen? Yeah, you have to earn the demo. And if you're an account executive, just because it's on the calendar, it's still not earned. Okay, Uh, earning the demo in my eyes when you're an account executive is letting them know you've done essentially free work. You're spending time, energy, money away from the company and away from your family to research and calibrate and customize and tailor a conversation specific to the needs and the uniqueness of that prospect. And the better and the more ways you can articulate that between when the meeting's booked and when the meeting's supposed to happen, even if it's a next day meeting, it's it's going to be valuable. And so those are the things you want to do. We don't book anything that's farther than two weeks. It's a rule. Yeah. So if it's farther than two weeks out, we don't even call it a meeting. We call it interest and we don't even waste the client's time with it. We don't, we keep it in our nurture. We call them warm leads until we convert them to hot and hot is a, a meeting within two weeks. That's how we classify it. Yeah. However, even that is to me far. So it's, it's next day, same day, same week is how you want to look at it. Here's yeah. the statistics. Every day that passes between when you book it and when it's supposed to happen, 50% goes away when it comes to shows up. So if it's one day, it's 50%. If it's two days, it's 25. If it's three days, it's 13.5. You know what I mean? So it's like every day is 50% no-show rate. And then every time you touch them between that, increases it up again. So it's almost like keeping the the, the plate spinning and you want to make sure you're touching that 
consistently to keep it spinning or it's or it's going to fall and it's not going to work. I always like to say when it comes to prospects, the half-life of their enthusiasm is measured in minutes and hours. It is not measured in days and weeks. Well, Gabe Lulo, this has been such an amazing pleasure. Please tell us how can we get connected and stay connected to you and Alleyoop and all the amazing things that your firm does. Yeah, company information is right on our website, alleyoop.io. Alleyoop.io is our website. Um, I'm hyper-responsive on LinkedIn. I post daily. So you can always reach out there for more content or connect with me through a direct message. And it's just Gabe Lulo, and you'll be able to find me um, right on, on LinkedIn. I look forward to having a conversation. Awesome. Gabe, this has been so tremendous. Thank you for all the value bombs. Thank you for all your wisdom. Thank you, David. And that wraps up another episode of The Selling Show. Hey, tell you what, if you like us, rate us and review us on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, tell a friend, go grab the notes and downloads and extras at thesellingshow.com. See you next time. 